Hey everybody, and welcome to a new installment of Woman Once Removed. Tonight, I'll do my story about Dr. Barbara. If you're interested, then keep watching. I had surgery with Dr. Stanley H. Barber, August the 4th, 1977. But how did I decide to use Dr. Barber? There was no internet back then. There was actually nothing to give us information on the doctors that were available, except by chance meeting with other transsexual people. The first girls in my community, they went to New York City, they went to Lexington, Kentucky, they went to Charlottesville, Virginia, and there was a doctor in Florida. Now, we made sure to inspect those <laughs> surgeries as the best we could and decide which one looked more natural and discussing the complications and all that kind of thing. Then one night, we met these two girls that came into Olean's Lounge. They were beautiful women. Just a little bit too beautiful. So we kind of looked at them and watched them. And finally, we had the nerve to go over and speak with these ladies. They were the Hanover sisters. Now, the names I'm using are not correct names because I don't want to spill any beans on people because these girls were living in stilts. But I'll call them the Hanover sisters, Anne and Tiffany. They were very beautiful. And they were real sisters. And actually, there was a third sister in the family so they were three transsexual sisters that all transitioned. Anne was the oldest. She was older than me. And Tiffany was a little bit younger than me. And there was a middle sister there. They all had surgery with Dr. Stanley H. Baber. So when they showed us his work, we were sold on Dr. Barbara because as far as we knew, as far as we can tell, they look like natural vaginas. He was the leading sex change surgeon in the United States at that time. Now, I have to bring it to your attention that it had not been too awfully many years that performing sex change surgeries in the United States had been illegal. Everybody that had surgery but prior to that went overseas. Now, John Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland was the first, first clinic to do sex change surgeries. They put together a gender identity clinic and they were performing surgeries there. And I will call this sex change surgeries because, in my opinion, and this channel is about my opinion, transsexuals have sex change surgeries. Not gender change surgeries, but sex change. Sex is the organs you're born with. Gender is what's in your head and never changes. So I prefer to say sex changes and that's what they were, and that's what I had. But uh, John Hopkins was the first to do their surgeries, and they usually trained the other doctors that started doing the surgery. Now, Dr. Stanley Barber, he was approached by a social worker that he knew that told him that they were transsexual and they wanted him to do their surgery. Well, he had never done that kind of surgery. He had started his medical practice basically out of medical school whenever he went to the Korean War and was a MASH surgeon. 
just like the TV show MASH, he was the chief surgeon in a MASH unit. So he got a lot of experience with different kinds of surgeries. But sex change was not th something he knew how to do. So he wrote to John Hopkins and they sent him diagrams how to do the surgery. So that's how he got started doing the surgery. In the first few he did, he covered it up because he practiced in a Catholic hospital in Trinidad, Colorado that was owned and run by the Catholic Church and it was run by nuns. So he had to cover this up at first. <laughs> the name of the hospital was Mount San Raphael Hospital. So when I decided I was ready to go for surgery, that's just where I decided to go. The pricing was very uh, inexpensive in today's money. But in 77 money, it was, it was pretty high. Uh, it had took some saving and, and everything. But the way Dr. Bible worked, you had to send him a biography explaining your life and what you thought the surgery would do for you and photographs. And he let you know that when you came, he would do his his uh, interview, and if he decided that the surgery was not right for you, he could refuse to give you surgery. So we all knew that when we went. We all knew that there was a chance that if something went wrong, we might either die or never have any more feelings down there. We knew that there was a chance that this would not end good. So. When I went to Dr. Barber, I flew for the very first time. I was scared to death, and I had to go by myself. <laughs> so this was an experience for me. I flew into um, Denver, Colorado, and from there I had to take Frontier Airlines up into Pueblo, Colorado. And in Pueblo, I had to take a bus <laughs> up into the Colorado mountains to Trinidad, Colorado. Now this bus was just like you see in those movies down in Mexico where you had people. They had all kind of luggage with them. They were some people that had chickens in crates and it was a lot of Chicanos and they would stop along the way and let people out in these little villages and stuff. It felt just like you were in Mexico, but this was in Colorado. <laughs> and when I got to the uh, bus station, I was picked up by a very handsome Chicano cab driver who was on his vacation from the university, and this is what he did on his vacation to make extra money. He was so nice and so handsome. And he actually asked me to have drinks with him later. So he took me to this hotel. And this hotel was a big two-story, old western-looking hotel. It had the, the counter that looked like in the old west uh, hotels with a big uh, ornate uh, brass catch register and had a grand staircase that went up like, just like in the movies. And it had an elevator, but it was kind of had the thing that came across it and everything. And a person in there operating the elevator <laughs> in 1977. I had never experienced this in my life. So they took me up and I noticed that on every floor they had a sitting room with a fireplace and all this antique furniture. But each room had its own private bathroom. And the uh, place where we were meeting for drinks was downstairs in this hotel. It was a nice little little uh, club kind of a thing that had music playing. And he came in and we started talking. And he started saying, yeah, you know, he said, uh, I very seldom see people coming up the mountain as beautiful as you are. Uh, most of the people we get coming up here are those people coming for that sex change, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> he 
it tickled me to death. So, of course, I lied and said I was coming up there to visit a friend. <laughs> I didn't want to tell him I was one of those. <laughs> so, he told me a nice place in town to have breakfast that sold these big, huge, what do you call them, flapjacks or something? Like a pancake, but they were as big as the plate. It's like one is all you could eat. They were so much. So that was the last meal I could have was breakfast because I was going in for consultation. And then after that, in the afternoon, I would be checking into the hotel for my surgery the next morning. So I couldn't have anything past, nothing solid past that breakfast. So I ate a really big breakfast that morning. And I went into Dr. Barber's office. And I'm gonna show you some pictures of Dr. Barber here. He, he was an older, very dignified looking man. Um, I found out later that he is a Jewish doctor, much like uh, other doctors with, that have been in the transsexual field, uh, like Dr. Hirschfeld in Germany. So. I have to say that the people who have helped me the most in my life have been Jewish doctors. So, thank you guys. So, look at the pictures here. Okay, I went into his office, and I remember that he took me into a room that was kind of on the end of the building, because it had windows. It had windows here, windows across here, and windows here, so they gave lots of light. And he had me lay on a table, and he had to look at everything, because he had to know what he had to work with. And he said, well, you know, we may have to wind up doing a skin graft because there's not much to work with. I said, sir, I don't care if it's shallow. I said, I do not want a skin graft because I had had a girlfriend that went to Charlottesville, Virginia that had to have a skin graft and she was extremely scarred on her upper thigh and I did not want that. I said, I would rather have shallow depth and try to work it out with dilation and not have, you know, scars. So that's what I opted with. They weren't any other kind of, of colon surgery or anything that, at that time. So, um, then after that, we, we uh, go back into his consultation room and he talks to me a little bit and he approved me right quick. And I was so pleased with that. He told me that I would be a very successful woman. And, um, so I leave his office and go back to the hotel and get everything together. I believe I watched the Perry Mason on the television, and took a bath, and then uh, got a taxi. Thank God I got a different taxi driver because I didn't want that guy seeing me go to the hospital. <laughs> So I knew that I was gonna to have to have all this blood work and stuff done, and I've always been terrible about needles, but I got my mind ready for it. Whatever happens from this moment on, I have made this decision. So whatever happens is okay. If I wind up dying tomorrow, that's okay. I'm ready. So I went through all that, and then they put me in a room, and we have what they call private rooms during the time we're convalescing. But on the day that you get there, you're sharing the room with the girl that's getting ready to leave. And the day you get ready to leave, there's a girl coming in. So the day that I was uh, checking in, there was a beautiful girl. She, she had short red hair, and she really did look like a young Lucille Ball. And her name was Lucy. And uh, she goes to saying what a fan she is of Lucille Ball. And, and we talked about that for a while. And then she leaves. 
and uh, then I, I, that night they have to uh, prep me for surgery. And I was, of course, ashamed, embarrassed. And all of the orderlies that worked there were Chicano. Chicano is is a type of Mexican, I guess. They're, they're uh, Latina, that's all I really, really know. But if they're in Colorado, they call them Chicanos. I'm not trying to be offensive, but that's an offensive word. That's just what they told me. And they were the sweetest ladies. And when I was having to be prepped, that means they have to shave you and all that kind of stuff. And I put the eye down and everything. I put the pillow over my head because I was so embarrassed. She says, honey, come tomorrow morning, you will never have to worry about this again. It'll be gone. I said, I am so excited for that. So, <laughs> so um, then you give you something to sleep so that you can sleep real good. And then the next morning, early, it was daybreak, whenever they get ready. And they come in and they give you something to relax you. And as they were wheeling me down, I was being accompanied by a Catholic priest. It's like he was doing the last rites in case I was going to die. <laughs> but he was such a sweetheart. He was telling me that, that uh, when I finished with my surgery, I was going to be one in the eyes of the Lord. And he made me feel so good about what I was doing. You know, so many other religious people try to make you feel bad or guilty about it, but he was making me feel so blessed to have him beside me. And he was with me up until the moment I went into the operating room. But I remember going into the operating room because I was scared to death. It was so bright. And it seemed like I woke up from that, that anesthetic that was trying to relax me. And I thought, Lord, I think I got down to like 95 before I went out. But when I woke up, I was not in that much pain. I was surprised about the the non-pain I was going through because I had heard so many heard so many scary horror stories where people said, oh, it's like a bomb going off between your legs. It's the worst pain I've ever felt in my life. And on and on and on. And I'm thinking, where's that pain? When I'm going to wake up? There was, it was soreness. There were some aches. But as soon as I woke up enough, they give me something for that. But I never experienced that excruciating pain that I was told I was going to have. Now, when I had breast implants, I had those done outpatient. And I had to be drug up off of the table, bandaged up, and put into a car to be driven home without pain medication. And I thought I'd die that day. But with this, I was fine. I was laying in bed. And he had already asked in advance, could, could he call anybody after I was awake? And of course, I asked him to call my parents. And I've told this story before. He, he called my parents and he said, Miss Beaver, because that was my last name. He said, Miss Beaver, this is Dr. Biber in Colorado, and I'm just calling to let you know let you know that your little girl is doing just fine. So she looked at my dad and she said, "This is the doctor in Colorado, and he said that your little girl is doing just fine." So that was the end of that, and I never experienced a lot of problems the whole time I was in there. I was in the bed, I'm thinking eight days, and then got up on the eighth day, and then walked, and then the next day, the ninth day, we were checked out. I'm thinking that's the way it was. It was 1977, I can't remember a whole lot. Uh, I remember I had taken books and magazines with me, and. I was, got, I was able to get on the phone uh, with the girl who was in another room that had surgery the same day I did. So we got to talk about, you know, 
what we were experiencing and all that. But I think she was the day after me because I was able to go in there the day I left and speak to her. That's the way it was. But the night before, I, I met the girl that was coming in to have surgery after I left. She was so beautiful. Uh, she was a Native American. She had long, dark hair. And I honestly could not tell what kind of surgery she was in there for. I said, may I ask what kind of surgery you're here for? <laughs> she says, only if you'll tell me what kind of surgery you're here for. <laughs> so we told each other and we were both shocked because we had not pegged each other. We kind of assumed that's what it should be, but she had no markers at all on her face or body. She was beautiful in that long black hair. <laughs> oh my goodness. So I had some great experiences. Uh, when I got ready to leave, uh, I took, instead of taking that bus ride back, I thought, I just cannot accept this bus ride back. <laughs> so, I decided to hire that taxi cab, a different taxi cab. <laughs> And uh, they took me all the way to the airport in Pueblo, where I got on Frontier Airline again. It hit every little air pocket, make you think you're fixing to crash. <laughs> and then backtracked uh, all the way home. And the day I got home in August of 1977, as I was going across the railroad track, going home to my apartment, it came over the radio that Elvis Presley had just died. So that I always have that in my memory when they talk about the date of Elvis's death. That was the date that I got home from having my surgery. I said, you see there, he killed him. He heard about my surgery and I said, it killed him. <laughs> so, um, that was my experience of my trip to Colorado. <laughs> uh, see if there's anything I missed here. Yeah, besides Dr. Marcy Bowers, Dr. Bobber trained a lot of doctors whenever uh, he perfected his techniques because he was the first doctor to do the inner and outer labia and experimenting with the clitoris. He's the first doctor that did that. And so that's the reason he became known as the leading sex change doctor and Trinidad is the sex change capital of the world because people went there from all over the world. They were famous for their surgery. And he trained so many doctors that went on to be leading transsexual surgery doctors. So chances are, if you have surgery in the United States, your doctor has been trained by Dr. Stanley H. Fiber. All right, girls, my little story. Y'all have a good evening. Love y'all, some of you at least. <clears throat> I think I wanted to do a postscript here. Dr. Stanley H. Barber passed away at the age of 82 from pneumonia. Pneumonia that he got on a cattle drive. He was 82 years old and was taking his cattle to sell with a real cattle drive. He got sick while out sleeping under the stars. <laughs> that man died like he lived, doing exactly what he liked to do. Here's to you, 
Dr. Barber. You gave me my life. 